day, students. Welcome once again to Lagos State e-learning program for SS3 students during the statewide lockdown period. My name is Adejobi Monini Nuola Ajibi Kemesis. I'm your chemistry teacher for the day, and our topic to be considered is radioactivity. Quickly, let me go through the objectives for this first segment of this lesson. We want to define radioactivity. We will define a radioactive substance and give examples. We will mention types of radioactivity, give the alternative name for radioactivity, and then round up with nuclear reactions and radioactive emissions. So let's start with the first objective. What is radioactivity? Radioactivity is the spontaneous disintegration or breakup of a substance until a stable nucleus is obtained and the reaction is usually accompanied by emission of rays or particles that are often very dangerous or hazardous to plants, animals, and most importantly, human beings. Now, that means a reaction that is radioactive, when we say it is spontaneous, most of the time it occurs of its own accord. That is, a lot of the times it may not be initiated. Now let's look at what a radioactive substance is. A radioactive substance obviously must be an unstable material that disintegrates, that is, that breaks up by emitting radiations that are often very dangerous or hazardous to plants, animals, and like we said the other time, most importantly, human beings. So let's go to the next objective, examples of radioactive elements. But I want to substitute that word elements for isotopes because we have some atoms that exist in different forms with different masses and not all these forms are actually radioactive. For instance, number one, uranium. Uranium-238 and uranium-235 are radioactive. The numbers I'm going to be quoting refers to the atomic masses of these elements. The second one, cobalt-60, followed by strontium-90 and then polonium-214. Of course, there are more. These are just a few examples of radioactive isotopes or radioactive elements. Now, let's look at types of radioactive reactions. There are basically two. The first one, natural radioactivity. These ones occur in nature. Those are the ones that are actually spontaneous. And then the second one, artificial radioactivity. These are man-made radioactive reactions. They are induced or started by man. The next thing in our objective has to do with the alternative name for radioactive reactions. In some of your textbooks, you will find nuclear reactions, nuclear chemistry, and some will say radioactivity. The three mean the same thing, which means an alternative name for radioactivity is simply nuclear reactions or nuclear chemistry. Now let's talk about the types of nuclear reactions. There are basically two. The first one, nuclear fission. This is the breaking of a nucleus of high mass to give two or more nuclei of lighter mass units with the evolution of a large amount of energy. Again, nuclear fission, breaking of a nucleus of high mass to give two or more nuclei of lighter mass units with evolution of a large amount of energy. Now, nuclear fusion, rather, nuclear fusion is a process in which two or more nuclei of light masses combine to form a heavier and more stable nucleus, obviously with the release of a high amount of energy. Now, from the two definitions I've given of nuclear reactions, you will agree with me that the two of them emit energy into the surroundings. That automatically tells us that they are both exothermic reactions. So we can safely say that all radioactive reactions are exothermic. Now let's look at uh, radioactive emissions before we time out and then we'll come back later. Radioactive emissions actually refers to the types of particles or rays produced during radioactive or nuclear reactions. There are essentially three. The first one, alpha particles or alpha rays. These are essentially helium particles. The second one, beta particles. And these are streams of electrons. They are negatively charged. Um, 
I need to tell you that the alpha particles are positively charged. And the last one, gamma rays. These are electromagnetic waves of short wavelength. We'll stop here for a while and then come back later. Thank you. Welcome back. We are still on the topic radioactivity. And in this segment, we'll be looking at a few questions that you may possibly meet in the exams. And uh, by looking at these questions, we obviously would have covered some of the things you are expected to know in your syllabus under radioactivity. So let's take the first question, question one. Mention the instruments used for detecting radioactive emissions. These instruments are essentially three. The first one, Geiger Muller counter. The second one, scintillating counter. The third one, diffusion chamber. The second question, state three uses of radioactivity. Although the question say, say states three uses, I'm going to be stating more than three so that you'll be able to remember at least three. And to treat these, I'm going to be looking at some sectors of human life and see the application or the uses of radioactivity in those sectors. The first one, in the industrial sector, radioactive or nuclear reactions are sources of energy to power lots of industrial processes that require a large amount of energy. Secondly, in situations where pipes are laid over large expanse of land or extremely long distances, possibly maybe across a state or around a nation, radioactive reactions are used for the detection of leakages in such pipes. For instance, uh, if, I wouldn't know whether Nigeria does this, but you know that petroleum pipes are laid across the nation. It's not practically possible for human beings to be going around to check where these things are leaking, but with the use of radioactive reactions, you can actually monitor where these uh, pipes are leaking. The third one, uh, radioactive reactions are used to determine level of liquids in very large and massive industrial tanks. And still under the industries, they are used to control the thickness of paper and plastic sheets. Now let's look at application in medicine. Radioactivity is used for treatment of various forms of cancer in the body. I'm sure you have heard about chemotherapy before. Number two, they are radioactive elements are used as tracers to monitor drugs administered in body tissues and organs to see the extent of effectiveness or whether there is possibly any damage. In geology, radioactivity is used to determine the age of rocks and archaeological samples. I'm sure you have heard about carbon dating before. This is actually a radioactive reaction used in geology. That's why they would tell you that some rocks are five thousand years old, some are three thousand years old. Anytime you hear things like that, just remember that that is the application of radioactivity in geology. Secondly, now let's go to take another question. And this question says, itemize three disadvantages of radioactivity. Again, I will be giving you more than three so that you'll be able to remember at least three. Number one, radiations used in treatment of cancer are usually not specific in their activity. A lot of the times these radiations destroy, that is they ionize other cells in the body in the process of trying to kill the cancer cells. And this is the reason why many cancer patients die while being treated with chemotherapy. Number two, there is this serious challenge of the need to safely store radiations. Human beings cannot always be careful. In the process of storing this radiation, sometimes there are leakages, and once these leakages get into the atmosphere and they get absorbed by human beings, a lot of health hazards, which sometimes may take the lives of those whose bodies have absorbed that radiation, or those radiations rather. Number three, although radioactive reactions are a source of industrial energy, the waste generated in the process pose serious health hazards to life. And number four, radiations obviously are not meant to be absorbed in the body for a long period. So people working using radioactive substances ought to be extremely careful. Many times the level of radiations in their body have to be monitored mandatorily and statutorily to safeguard their lives. I believe you have been able to 
pick a few things and you'll be able to answer these questions when you meet them, if and when you meet them in the exam hall. We'll time out again and come back later. Thank you for listening. Students, you're welcome back once again to the classroom. And uh, in this segment, I will also want to be taking a few questions, believing that uh, by doing that, we will also have covered some of the things you are expected to know. The first question here this time around, mention two differences between nuclear and chemical reactions. All the reactions you've been taught before in chemistry are the normal chemical reactions. So we want to look at differences between nuclear and chemical reactions. And again, I'm going to be giving you more than two, although the question says two. I believe in the exam hall, you'll remember two. So under nuclear reactions, these reactions involve change in the nucleus of the atom. But in chemical reactions, there's no change in the nucleus of the atom. All that we have is rearrangement of electrons in the atom. Number two, the rate of reactions in nuclear reactions is not affected by external factors. By that I mean temperature, pressure, catalyst, concentration, surface area, etc. But in normal chemical reactions, the rate of reactions is affected by all these external factors. Number three, the energy change in nuclear reactions is very high and very, very enormous. And it comes from nuclear fission and fusion of nuclear. But under chemical reactions, the energy change is extremely low when compared to nuclear reactions. And then this low energy comes from breaking and formation of bonds. And number four, the masses of the species involved in nuclear reactions are strictly not conserved. That means nuclear reactions don't necessarily follow the law of conservation of mass. But chemical reactions, the masses of the species involved are conserved. That is, they obey the law of conservation of mass. Now let's take the second question. Compare the properties of radioactive emissions. By that we mean you compare the properties of alpha particles, beta particles, and gamma rays. Number one, alpha particles are fast moving streams of positively charged particles. Beta particles are fast moving streams of negatively charged particles, whereas gamma rays are electromagnetic waves of very short wavelength. Take note that I did not say gamma particles. They are gamma rays because they are waves of very short length. Number two, alpha particles have a mass of four units each. For beta particles, because they are essentially streams of electrons, their masses are negligible, and we really cannot talk about the mass of waves under gamma rays. Number three, alpha particles are deflected towards the negative plate of an electromagnetic field. This is very obvious because they are positively charged. Beta particles are deflected towards the positive plate of an electromagnetic field, and you need to know that gamma rays are neutral. They carry no electric charge, so they go through no deflection. Number four, alpha particles have low penetrating power. Beta particles have a higher penetrating power than alpha particles. And gamma rays have the highest penetrating power out of the three radioactive emissions. So if you were asked to arrange them, in the order of increasing penetrating power, you start with alpha particles, followed by beta, and then followed by gamma particles. Number five, alpha particles have powerful ionizing effect on any gas they pass through. Beta particles have moderate ionizing effect on any gas they pass through. Their ionizing effect is lower than that of alpha particles. And for gamma rays, they have the least ionizing effect on any gas they pass through out of all these three radiations. This is where we're going to be drawing the cutting under this topic, radioactivity. I believe you have gained a few things, perhaps a lot. And so please go through them once again 
and be sure that when these questions come in your exams, success is guaranteed. I wish you the very best. Once again, I want to say thank you for listening. God bless you. Thank you.